This video is brought to you by Magellan TV, a new documentary streaming service founded by filmmakers who love history. Their mission is to tell the great stories that have defined the human experience. And with more than 3,000 excellent programs available on Magellan, it's hard to stop once you start. They've got everything from the Greeks to the Great War, plus modern history, biographies, scientific profiles, true crime, and, well, so much more. And their team adds more content every single week. And what's one thing you love about paid streaming services? Of course, there are no ads, just great great content. They've got great playlists of content covering both macro and micro facets of antiquity and the Roman Empire, including titles like Rome Empire Without Limits. So if you already binged through all of our playlists on Rome and Romans and are looking for more content, then of course you need to give Magellan a look. Right now, you guys can get a one month free trial with Magellan by clicking on the link in the description below. It's content for days and days, so let Magellan hook you up. You'll be glad you did. And back to today's video. For most Americans, he's a historical bogeyman, the Mexican leader who massacred the defenders of the Alamo and then lost Texas in a revolution. If people north of the border know much more about him, it's often limited to his comeback role in the Mexican-American War or perhaps his legendary, vainglorious excesses. But there was so much more to Santa Ana than a footnote role in US history. Far from cartoonish villain, he was a consummate political survivor, one so capable he managed to single-handedly dominate Mexican politics for over 30 years. Born Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana near the port city of Veracruz, Santa Ana had an ability to shapeshift like no other. Whether as royalist or rebel, liberal or conservative, democrat or dictator, he always found a way to not just survive the changing political winds, but thrive. The one constant in a half century of chaos. Holder of the presidency no less than 11 times, this is the story of the man who shaped Mexico's destiny, both for better and for worse. For a guy who winds up repeatedly becoming president of his nation, perhaps the most surprising thing about Santa Ana is that he never really wanted Mexico to be independent. Born in Zalapa near Veracruz on February 21, 1794, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana grew up as a beneficiary of Spanish rule. Mexico at this time was the viceroyalty of New Spain, a bear moth including not just modern-day Mexico, but also Central America and huge chunks of what we'd call the southwestern U.S. This was a world segregated along strict lines, one that placed the boy's family near the top. His parents were criollos, people of ethnic Spanish descent who'd been born in the New World. While they ranked below the Peninsulares, people born in Spain proper, they did more than okay for themselves. Santana's dad owned estates and had made some money doing business for the Spanish crown. They weren't rich, but they were wealthy enough that Santa Ana could drop out of school and still land a decent job with a merchant in Veracruz, New Spain's key port. Not that it was business the boy had his heart on, but the military. At the age of 16, Santa Ana started pestering his dad about joining the army. Despite having served himself, his pop pushed back, reluctant to allow his son to become a cadet. But if there was one thing Santa Ana was good at, even age 16, it was persuading people to let him do what he wanted. So it was that in June 1810, he enrolled in the army of New Spain. Now, if you know anything about Mexican history, you'll know that this was some especially bad timing. 1810 was when the viceroyalty collectively lost its just two years earlier, Napoleon had deposed the Bourbon monarchy in Spain. In South America, this had been the trigger for the wars of independence. But New Spain had so far resisted the cry of revolution. Note the key phrase there, so far. At the time Santa Ana joined the cadets, a region known as the Bahio was on the cusp of exploding. A silver mining region, Bahio had been walloped by an economic crisis, and now famine, despair, and resentment were its main exports. It was in this fertile soil that Don Miguel Hidalgo would plant the seeds of Mexican independence. Sadly, we don't have time to go into Hidalgo today. Hopefully, we can give him another video all his own at some point. But just know that he was a priest who hated poverty almost as much as he loved the idea of splitting off from Spain. On September the 16th, 1810, he combines these two themes into the fabled Cry of Dolores. The most famous speech in Mexican history, the cry was a call for his poverty-stricken congregation to take up arms. 
to overthrow the Viceroyalty. Far more so than Napoleon deposing the king, this speech turned the people into a republican army, one that swept across New Spain. But rather than take part in Mexico's independence struggle, Santa Ana would try to crush it. As a new recruit, Santa Ana was placed under the command of Joaquin de Arredondo and set out to destroy the rebels. Since the Mexican War of Independence was a total shit show, that original mission soon span off into also fighting both Indian uprisings and incursions from private adventurers known as filibusters. It was this latter group that in 1812 saw Santa Ana deployed to Texas. There he was spellbound by both Arredondo's brutality and his brilliance. A strategic genius, Arredondo was able to pull off stuff like the Battle of Medina, which saw him reduce a rebel force of 1,400 to just 100 survivors by simply choosing his defensive position well. But it was what came next that really left an impression on the teenage soldier. Arredondo followed up his victories by not just mass executing rebels, but also punishing their families and placing whole towns under martial law. The tactics were cruel, but they were also effective. It was a military lesson the young Santa Ana would never forget. As the war dragged on, it began to look like Santa Ana had picked his side well. After years of extremely bloody fighting, Hidalgo was long dead. Meanwhile, the Bourbon monarchy had been restored to the Spanish throne. Then, in 1816, a brand new viceroy was sent over from Spain, one who was less like, kill the rebel scum, and more like, maybe we can reach some kind of agreement, yes? It seemed like the war was winding down, and Santa Ana was winding down with it. Now in his mid-twenties, it had gone from fighting Indians to being part of a group that helped rebuild their villages. Although disciplines for misusing his unit's funds had also risen up the ranks. It could have been the beginning of a long, successful career in New Spain's army, had New Spain not been on the cusp of complete collapse. In 1820, a mutiny in the Spanish port of Cadiz saw a new liberal constitution forced upon the king. Overnight, staying under the monarchy went from something New Spain's conservatives desperately wanted to something about as appealing as a hamburger made of anthrax. The first to switch sides was Augustin de Iturbide. Supposedly the head of the anti-rebel forces, Iturbide instead crossed the lines in early 1821, joining forces with one of the biggest rebel groups. Together, they marched on the capital. It was at this moment that Santa Ana made his first great pivot. Declaring himself in support of the rebels, he took control of Veracruz, bringing it over to the Republican side. And he couldn't have timed it any better. As we'll repeatedly see, the genius of Santa Ana wasn't that he often switched sides, but that he usually did so with impeccable timing at the moment when his new support counted the most. Seeing the growing rebellion, New Spain threw in the towel, negotiations were opened, and on September the 28th, Mexico was declared an independent state. While not key to victory, Santa Ana's pivot to the rebels was still recognized. He was promoted to general. In his new role, he fully supported Iturbide's post-independence power grab, applauding as the former soldier declared himself Emperor Agustin I of Mexico. But the first Mexican empire was way too unstable for Santa Ana to stick on side for long. As Emperor Augustin was less an Augustus than he was a budding Palpatine, a paranoid, a repressive tyrant. He shut dissolved Congress, moved to set up a dictatorship, but his stupidest move came in Veracruz. Not liking Santa Ana's obvious ambition, Agustin seized on financial irregularities to strip the general of his rank. Unfortunately, he did this just as it was becoming clear that it alienated all of his supporters. With impeccable timing, Santa Ana switched sides again, declaring himself in support of the dissolved Congress. In reality, the only thing he really supported was Santa Ana, but the results were still the same. After Santa Ana broke, other generals followed. That winter, all the heroes of the Independence War, one by one, came out against Agustin. On March 19, 1823, the first Mexican emperor resigned, fleeing into exile. His exit led to the Central American states jumping ship from Mexico, significantly reducing the young nation's territory. But it also led to the restoration of the Republic. Although he championed it at the time, Santa Ana later admitted that he had no idea what republicanism really involved. So long as it meant he was on the winning side, though, anything was fine by him. As the restored Congress began to reorganize Mexico, Santa Ana took a step back from public life. He exited the military, became the civilian governor of Veracruz. He married Inez Garcia. But if anyone assumed that that was the end of Mexico's man of destiny, they couldn't have been more wrong. Santa Ana's story and his hold over this young country was only just beginning. The 
The fall of Agustin gave everyone an unwelcome taste of the divisions that would soon split Mexico. On one side stood the conservatives in all their pro-church, pro-strong leader, pro-centralized state glory. On the other stood the liberals who mixed a desire for social justice with an even bigger desire for power to be devolved to Mexico's individual states. After Agustin fled, it was the liberals who emerged triumphant, writing a brand new constitution that gave the federal government almost no power over the states. Unfortunately, this coincided with a massive economic slump. Unable to effectively raise taxes, the government defaulted on its loans. Poverty began to stalk the nation. It was against this dark background that the fateful election of 1828 was held. If you thought the 2020 US election was divisive, just know that Mexico's 1828 election makes it look like the model of gentlemanly conduct. There were riots, uprisings, disorder which lasted not just for years, but for decades. From 1828 to 1855, the Mexican presidency would change hands no less than 48 different times. Care to guess which political chameleon benefited from the chaos? As the echoes of that terrible election reverberated across the nation, Santorana was finding himself more popular than ever. He was helped in this by Spain, which decided the 1828 debacle represented a golden opportunity to land an expeditionary force and retake the country. Instead, they landed at Tampico only for Santorana to raise an army, charge down, and single-handedly force them to retreat. This was so heroic that grateful Mexicans christened Santorana the Napoleon of the West. A name he, with characteristic ego, seems to have suggested himself. Yet, who could really disagree? By now, Santa Ana had helped see off a vice royalty, an emperor, and the Spanish navy. Who knew what his next step would be? Actually, Anastasio Bustamante thought he might have a pretty good idea. Supposedly, the vice president, Bustamante, had overthrown his boss in December of 1829 and was now in the process of turning Mexico into a loose federation of states in another Augustan-style centralized dictatorship. The only problem was that each state tended to have its own regional strongman, or caudillo, none of whom were eager to give up any power. Realizing the Correos might rebel, Bustamante tried to beat them to it, dispatching the army to kill Santorana. Sadly for him, this went about as well as Ned Flanders trying to take on the Incredible Hulk. When he got wind of the approaching army, Santorana went on the attack, driving them out of Veracruz, out of his state, and all the way back to the capital. In December 1832, his men marched triumphantly into Mexico City. Defeated, Bustamante fled into temporary exile, the fourth leader that Santorana had helped overthrow. This time, though, the man of destiny was through with simply deposing bad governments. Now he wanted to lead one. Antonio Lopez de Santorana became Mexico's eighth president in May of 1833. His ascension was seen as a triumph for Mexico's liberals. At first, it really was. Santorana was a true Cordillo, a guy for whom having power was a lot more fun than actually exercising it. After a short stay in the capital, he put his VP, the radical liberal Valentin Gomez Ferrez, in charge, and he went home to Veracruz to enjoy his shiny new title. But if the liberals thought Santorana's shape-shifting days were over, uh, they were in for a bit of a nasty shock. By 1835, Farias's radical reforms had pissed off so many people that revolts were breaking out. Rather than back his guy, though, Santorana rode back to Mexico City, overthrew him, and announced himself the head of a new conservative dictatorship. It was a head-spinning move, a political shift so jarring it induced whiplash. And there was worse to come. The Correo who delivered Mexico from multiple despots was now about to become one of the most despotic of all of them. Santorana's transformation from liberal champion to conservative tyrants was nothing if not wholehearted. Imagine if Bernie Sanders showed up tomorrow at a MAGA rally leading chants of Stop the Steal. Your brain just probably wouldn't be able to grasp it, right? Well, Santorana's pivot was that weirdness times a million. Having decided that tacking right was the only way to stay in power, the president now went all in. Congress was dissolved, leading liberals sent into exile. Finally, in late 1835, Las Siete Leyes, or The Seven Laws, were published, stripping the states of their powers and dumping them all in the hands of Santorana. For historians, this is the point when Mexico's first republic ends, replaced by something called the Centralist Republic. For people at the time, though, it was an outrage. Rebellions blew up across the nation, most famous in Zacatecas and, of course, Texas. 
In most English language documentaries on Santorana, this is where the meat of the story lies, in a detailed account of his screw-ups in the Texas Revolution. But that's not what we're aiming for. Our goal here is to give you a decent overview of his entire life, rather than the bits that you've already heard in grade school. Of course, the downside is that we're about to piss off a whole bunch of Texans by barely spending two minutes on their foundational story. So, sorry about all the stuff we're about to miss out, guys. Please feel free to completely overreact in the comments below. Not long after Texas erupted, Santorana personally rode north at the head of 7,000 men to put down the rebellion. Although his army was under-equipped, things started pretty well. In February 1836, they laid siege to a small Spanish mission that the Texans had overrun. Known as the Alamo, it fell in a bloody battle in early March, one that ended with Santorana having all the captured men executed, a lesson he'd learned long ago watching Joaquim de Arredondo do his bloody work. Still, Santorana wasn't all bad. He let the women, children, and enslaved people who'd been at the Alamo go free. But this act of clemency was just a one-off. Santorana had, after all, studied hard under Arundondo, and he was determined to do his old commander proud. The pinnacle of this came with the Goliad massacre. On March the 27th, between 350 and 425 Texan prisoners of war were murdered under Santorana's orders, despite his Mexican commanders begging him to reconsider. But this turned out to be a legendary PR blunder, the new coke of war crimes. The rage generated by the massacre goaded the Texans on. On April the 21st, they hit Santorana with a surprise ambush, yelling, Remember the Alamo, remember Goliad. The Battle of San Jacinto was, frankly, an embarrassment for the Cadilla president. Captured with the threat of execution hanging over him, Santorana was forced to pivot again from bloodthirsty dictator to man desperate to cut a deal. That deal, signed in May of 1836, declared Mexico would both withdraw all of its troops from Texas and recognize the state's independence. In return, Santorana would return home alive. It was hardly a great homecoming, though. When Santorana arrived back in Mexico, his name was worse than mud. Worse than... Manure. He resigned the presidency, retired to his hacienda, and left politics, seemingly for good. After all, there was no way anyone could recover from such a disaster. Right? But Santorana wasn't just anyone. He was, perhaps, Mexico's greatest political survivor. And all it would take to change his fortunes would be one unhappy baker. A few years earlier, Mexico City had been gripped in one of the periodic waves of unrest that followed 1828. Amid the rioting, a French pastry shop was trashed, supposedly by Mexican soldiers. From this minor incident, Santorana would soon engineer a comeback so great that he'd be able to maintain his stranglehold on Mexican politics for another 20 years. In terms of things to start a war over, a damaged pastry shop isn't exactly invading Poland. But Louis Philippe I clearly didn't agree. In 1838, the French king suddenly demanded Mexico pay compensation not only to the offended baker, but to every other Frenchman who'd had property damaged in Mexico too. Still, there was the pastry shop that stuck in everyone's minds, which is why the French-Mexican conflict of 1838 has gone down in history as the Pastry War. That it helped Santorana return to power was sheer dumb luck. When it came time to invade, the French fleet landed at Veracruz. Famine Santorana was the only guy capable of leading the defense. And lead it, he did. Raising an army, he charged down, sent the French into retreat, and chased them all the way to the harbor. Their grape shot from a cannon mangled his left leg, forcing it to be amputated. Although Mexico ultimately lost the war in Santorana's leg, the optics couldn't have been better. Suddenly, Santorana was no longer the dumbass who lost Texas, but the hero who'd sacrificed his own leg protecting Mexico. It was a complete rehabilitation. So popular did Santorana become following the Pastry War that when the presidency again became vacant in 1841, there was only one clear replacement. Santorana's transformation from outcast to hero president was likely his greatest change so far. Yet it would also become his weirdest. By now, Mexico's man of destiny was firmly buying into his own hype. That inflated ego soon led him to do some crazy-ass stuff. The story of Santa Ana's leg tends to be the other thing that people know about him because it's just so batshit crazy. After the pastry war, the Cordillo had buried his leg at his hacienda. Now he was president again, he had it dug up, placed in a crystal coffin, and given a full military burial in Mexico City. There was a parade. Cannons were fired. Diplomats read speeches. It was, in short, vainglorious excess like Mexico had never seen before. Yet it was a mere taster 
of what was to come. While Santa Ana's earlier presidency had been marked by increasing centralization, his new reign, aside from a brief pause when he stepped down in 1842, was far weirder. Like Agustin, Santa Ana had become fixated on the idea of Mexico needing a monarch. Him. While he didn't quite declare himself king, he did force people to call him His Most Serene Highness and started signing his letters Santa Anna, Savior of the Fatherland, General of Division, Knight of the Great Cross of the Royal and Distinguished Spanish Order of Charles III, President of the Mexican Republic, Grand Master of the National and Distinguished Order of Guadalupe. Statues to him sprang up across Mexico City, streets were renamed after him, leaders forced to empty their coffers for His Most Serene Highness. But just like Agustin, Santorana also underestimated his country's tolerance for a decadent monarch. The last straw came in 1844. That year, Santorana's wife died, but rather than grieve, the 50-year-old announced that he would get married again, this time to a 15-year-old. For Mexican society, this was just too much. Rebellions exploded for the 10,000th time. Unable to raise an army, Santorana was forced to flee the capital. He was captured by an indigenous tribe who told the government they'd be happy to return him as a tamale, in other words, cooked and turned into snack food. But the new powers were done worrying about Santorana. Instead, the dictator was sent once again into exile, once again so disgraced that no one could imagine him ever staging another comeback. Once again, though, everybody would be proved wrong. By now, it should be clear that the key to Santa Ana's hold over Mexico wasn't that he was uniquely charismatic or capable, although he was certainly the former. It's that Mexico in this half century was so unstable that there was simply no way anyone but a Cordillo could hope to hold on to power. That went double when the instability came from outside, like from, say, a certain northern neighbor. The election of James K. Polk to the White House in 1844 would turn out to be the most destabilizing event yet. Polk was ruthlessly dedicated to expanding America. In 1845, he authorized the annexation of Texas, which Mexico still laid claim to. But it's really what came next that blew things up. In 1846, Polk dispatched troops to the disputed Mexican-Texan border. Considering this an invasion, a Mexican unit shot at them, killing 12. In retaliation, Congress declared war. The outbreak of the Mexican-American War ended the Centralist Republic. The government collapsed. Over in Cuba, Santa Ana saw his chance. Opening a communication channel with Polk, he offered to retake Mexico's presidency and settle the war on generous terms. All Polk had to do was let him run the blockade and get into his country. Evidently unaware of Santa Ana's reputation, Polk agreed. No sooner had Santa Ana landed than he switched sides again, rustling up an army to fight the Americans. It was a move which saw his street cred shoot up, but it wasn't enough to save Mexico. Santa Ana's army was equipped with surplus from the Napoleonic era, no match for American weapons. While they did win some battles, there was just no way they could win the war. Mexico City fell in September of 1847. Although Santa Ana tried to fight on, raising a guerrilla movement to harry American supply lines, his latest comeback was over. Once again, he was stripped of the presidency, and once again, he was sent into exile. Once again, it would just be temporary. The treaty the Americans forced on Mexico, you see, was nearly as destabilizing as the actual war. Mexico lost over half of its territory. Unable to cope with such a catastrophic defeat, subsequent governments simply collapsed one after the other. By 1853, the nation was an unholy mess, so much so that the conservative faction hatched a plan to dispense with democracy altogether, turning Mexico into a monarchy. They just needed someone strong in charge while the details were ironed out. Just for a year, say, until they could convince some European royal to come over and be king. And can you guess who they chose? On April the 20th, 1853, Santa Ana returned to power for the final time. As usual, he double-crossed everybody. Once he was secure, he killed the plans to invite some random royal over and instead made himself emperor in all but name. He would rule for life, choose his successor, and once again, he would be called his most serene highness. But, well, Mexicans didn't like this any more than they had the previous two times. In the end, Santa Ana's final undoing was just exiling leading liberals instead of killing them. From abroad, one liberal, Benito Juarez, hatched a plan to depose the undeclared emperor. With the help of a general in Mexico, he directed an uprising that chased Santa Ana from power for the billionth time. This time, no one but no one expected it to be the end. Surely Santa Ana would come back again and again like a slasher movie villain that can't be killed. Alas, once again, though, everyone was wrong. Santa Ana's 1855 exile marks the last time he ever had any influence on Mexican politics. What followed was an era dominated by Benito Juarez, one only broken when the conservatives finally got their wish and managed to install an emperor 
with French help. But they didn't pick Santorana to lead their empire. For the next few decades, Santorana bounced around the Caribbean, waiting for what he called his inevitable chance to return. He tried to stage another comeback just after the second Mexican emperor fell, only to be tried for treason and sent back into exile. This time, the state confiscated most of his property, and his serene highness was now penniless. Finally, in 1870, President Benito Juarez announced a general amnesty for all exiles. Still, Santorana waited until his old rival had died before slinking back home in 1874. By now, Mexico's man of destiny was old, partially deaf, nearly blind, forgotten by a country that had long ago moved on. Unable to make another bid for power, Mexico's great survivor died alone in poverty on June 21, 1876. Before the year was out, another Cordillo would have seized power. Known as Porfirio Diaz, he became the dictator Santorana had dreamed of being, ruling with an iron fist for 34 years. Compared to the other larger-than-life figures of Mexican history, Santorana is today semi-obscure, a villain in Texas's origin story, a funny, long-dead tyrant who once gave his own leg a state funeral. Certainly, his impact has been smaller than that of Porfirio Diaz or Don Miguel Hidalgo or Benito Juarez or, well, almost any other big name. His time at the top was a weird interlude when a vain strongman managed to fool people into thinking that he was the Mexican Napoleon. Yet this view does Santorana a disservice. Here was a leader who was nothing if not a product of his time, an agent of chaos born from one of the most chaotic periods the nation ever experienced. The saying goes, cometh the hour cometh the man. In Santorana, for better and for worse, Mexico found the perfect man for an imperfect era. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe and thank you for watching.